Right. That's our way of putting it, right? So, uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, probably. That's the right word. Uh, to, uh, we are meeting at 2 o'clock. So, how many of you are in this audience as parents? Parents. Excellent. And how much are of them for the staff? <laughs> Massive. Okay. So, I divided the first lecture as basically more geared towards the parents to understand uh, and a development of perspective. Um, so, I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, you've probably heard that word quite often because the reason is that it's a, it's a very passionate word. We also call them a shrink because the reason is they, they basically analyze the brain and stuff. So, um, just a brief background on myself is the, I'm a child psychiatrist. I'm board certified in both adult and child and adult psychiatry. Um, I, I went to US in 1991 when I was just finished medical school. Uh, then I did my uh, child psychiatry residency from St. Louis University, which is more of a psychodynamic way of training. It's basically called traditionally in the olden days about therapy, therapy, therapy. So you do therapy with patients and then you take those notes, go to a uh, psychoanalyst, and then you process the information about how to understand the child's work in a different way than medicine. And I went to Yale, and then at Yale University, I did my adult residency. Okay, so I have to see if I have your problems. Can you hear me now any better? Much better? Okay, yeah. So then I, after finishing my Yale uh, adult residency, uh, um, I went over to the Yale Child Study Center. We have a child study center that specifically geared towards more of the complex and the uh, learning about complex kids. So I was actually a National Institute of Mental Health fellow. The National Institute of Mental Health is a specialized branch in the U.S. where they actually develop people to do research. So I did that fellowship because I was interested in autism and development disabilities. So because the crux of the many kids we see are, uh, in those days was basically was the understanding that autism was really a complex topic. So there is so much information we need to learn. So how, so in the very olden days of autism is that autism kids don't have any other problems other than autism. Then came the, the concept so that all autism kids also can have mood issues, anxiety issues, attention issues, then they started medicating them. So the initial thought process was the medications, don't do it, do the therapy, then it changed into pharmacology model. So now, when we're looking at the advances in the psychiatry, it's no longer the main as a psychiatry because it's a neuropsychiatry. Because the reason is the, there is as much neurobiology, understanding neuroimmunology, uh, you know, neuropsychiatry, you need to know the pathways, you need to know the biology, you need to know the bio development. So it's a very complex field. Uh, but again, anywhere in the world, it is the same old challenge. Uh, there are not many who is experienced child psychiatrists. There are very few. So that's the challenge we always want to do. Uh, then came the, the next phase in the, in, the, in the field is the Pharmacology started to develop, but pharmacology was not adding enough. So now the new, um, you know, the buzzword is the neuromodulation. It's called uh, transcranial magnetic stimulus, the modulation of the brain using the, uh, you know, the, the magnets and many other ways of treating several different conditions. It's basically, it's actually FDA approved in the U.S. for treatment of depression, treatment of OCD. Uh, and then they it recently uh, actually got approved for the smoking cessation, smoking addiction, alcohol addiction. And it's basically expanding into many other areas, including the neurological conditions called dystonia, tremor, uh, multiple sclerosis, fatigue. So there is a, this is going to be the new technology that's going to come up in the next 10, 15 years, becomes a very common part of the lifestyle of that, you know, and the treatments. So these are, new treatments that require 
you to go see somebody for 30 days and go out of depression. So the time matters, especially when it comes to the depression in the kids, bipolar disorder in the kids, uh, lots of the conditions because the reason is the, the longer they suffer, they have a lots of ramifications in terms of economics, emotional development, their own struggles with the challenges of their own life. So the world is now getting towards how to stabilize these children faster and faster. So we added another layer, unfortunately, on top of that, the COVID. For about a year and a half, everybody's life stopped. And then we went back into the life. But can you imagine a year and a half in a child's life? Especially when they're developing. You know, when you're from 8 to 10, it's a very different challenge. You're 10 to 12, it's a very different challenge. If you are 13, 14, and you're going into college, it's a different challenge. So when you're missing a stage of your life, where you have a peer support, peer interaction, which is basically going to decide how you all are going to function. So when you lose it for a year and a half, it takes another five, six years to just to catch up that one and a half year. Once they go back into the real world. So the challenges now we have in the post-COVID world, we call it now, because of the post-COVID world, we have basically have a lot more problems, a lot more challenges, there is a substantial increase we have noticed in anxiety, OCD, since the post-COVID world and depression too. These are much harder to treat than what we used to do before COVID world was there. So we already added a layer of complexity, which is basically becoming very difficult to treat with the medication therapy. So we really need to develop more molecular targets to start doing that. Things like so the first part of the, uh, my lecture is basically more geared towards parents because the reason is the, I want to make sure that you understand how this is evolved because the reason is the, which we're knowing it, uh, because you are doing the right things, but sometimes you don't understand that the, you are doing it because the reason is the, where do I fit it? That's the second lecture because the reason is the, <clears throat> a lot of times what happens to people with be is the, you know, psychiatrist is the last person they want to go. And not because I'm a chemist or for it, but my point of view is that as a parent, uh, nobody tells you that what to do, what not to do. So knowing some basics first will know you what to do. So we need to empower parents because the reason is that you are the first observers of your children. Then the rest of us come into play what to do for you. But remember one thing is, the, your observations are the most powerful observations. If they're not validated, if they're not substantiated, then we are failing as providers to you because the reason is, the, if I cannot enter your world to do the work you're struggling with, then basically like, we're not doing other than we do the check boxes. Checking boxes is not the challenge, it doesn't need a lot of brain. What takes a lot of brain is to understand you guys, and help you understand your own words, what the illness is, and then the progression for it. If you are ready for it, you're ready for it. If you're not ready for it, you're ready one day. So that's the bottom line. Is. But education is the critical piece in the process. Okay? So well, I will start there. And then I'm, now I practice in Atlanta. By the way, I live in Atlanta. I, you know, I left Yale in 2003, and I started my own practice. And, I have a pretty routine practice, I call it, because I only see complex kids. I don't see the, the routine kids because the reason is that my time is only, I only can spend in those complex kids. So, so that's right. Uh, so, uh, for me to make this, how do I do this? Up and down? What is psychiatry? The branch of medicine concerned with study, diagnosis, and treatment of mental illness. So, average we hear in, the, uh, you know, in India is basically like six years of medical school, like we all did. 17, you go to medical school, you finish it by 21, you do a you know, rotatory internship, then you do what we call MD in this country, and then you do DM, which is called uh, 
and a doctor of medicine, which is basically considered super specialty in this country. We call it subspecialty there. So the differentiation is the uh, in, in the American system, you do undergraduate for four years. There are direct programs, which is seven year medical school. And then after that, you do three years of college, four years of medical school. Then you do uh, psychiatry residencies, four years. But you decide to do child psychiatry, that at two years. So you do seven to six years of the, between the, you know, the uh, psychiatry and uh, child psychiatry, five years total. If you do four years and two, it will be six. For me, I did the research fellowship, which I had on the four and a half years. So I, I did three plus two plus uh, two and a half. So my training was much more than many others, because the reason that's how I choose. If you had a PhD writing on the five years. So if you want an MD PhD degree, then it is uh, under four years. So averagely, most of the psychiatrists are, they come out of the medical school by 28 or 30 rather than here like coming out in 25 or 26. So that's the difference. Right. So uh, what does the specialty involve? First you need to know what normality is. Like you need to know what the normal developmental milestones are. When the kid smiles, when the kid sleeps, what age they walk, what age they, they crawl, what is the age. So those are normality. Okay. Once you know the range of normality, then you need to know what the abnormal is. Why it is important is because the reason that's where the first red flags go up. Because the reason the more you know about the normality, then you know that normal. Neuro, I, mean, uh, I mean, the neuroscience sort of you can call that normal psychology. But the bottom line is, even you don't know what normality, then you don't know what that normality is. So aware of that, the fact first learn to know what's normal. For everything there is, for example, like I'll go over this one of the slides. But basically, like if you are multilingual families, speech delay is common because they're learning three languages in their home. And on one they may be speaking at home, one they are learning at school, Hindi plus English. So all the kids are being exposed to three languages. So it actually can delay your speech and language. Like you may have a precautious language for some of them <coughs> because you have a chatty sister. There are actually studies looked at the, you know, overly talking mothers have children who are precautiously spoke early because the mother is just giving her an ear. So, so he doesn't have to other than, I guess, to defend himself, so he has to start talking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the part of it is that he understood what I'm going to say. So, um, and then the, uh, you need to also know the, you know, developmental stages of, you know, like, for example, there's several theories about it, like, so, the bottom line I always tell you is that the one that the sensory modalities get explored. So, for example, like, everybody knows in this room, every child in this room, has crawl and put some stuff in their mouth, All right? And then we give them that, uh, that uh, you know, something to, you know, why we do those? Because the reason is they, that's the stage he's basically putting everything in his mouth, he's figuring out what that really means. Is it something I can swallow, I can't swallow? That's when the mothers are hawkishly watching to say that they don't play with those bullies and stuff because the reason is they, they worry about what they're putting in the mouth. But again, as you're getting older, two, three years old and stuff, you see a lot of these kids basically like drawing their blank piece and going to the school. And that's basically because the reason is they at the page of their base for the first time in their life, <clears throat> they some themselves suffering from the parents and say, hey, I'm a separate person, but I've never figured it out. So I want to figure that out that I am an, a separate person from my mother. Until this point of time, mother was basically guiding me everywhere like, oh, if I fell, she picks up, if, she, you know, if I have a problem with hunger, she'll take care of me. But now I'm dragging my mother with me in this blanket, which is getting dirty every day, but he won't allow me to wash it. Because the reason that's, that's very important for him to be feeling comfortable. And someday the blanket goes, and he basically up and says, hey, bye mom, I'm going to my school, and he goes. So why this is important? Because the reason is the, these are important steps in your child development, you need to know. Many other parents observe that, oh, I took my kid to the park, and he doesn't play, and he just goes and stares at the wall while the rest of the kids are playing. But, you know, that's basically because the reason is that you realize that that kid is not interested in children. So why he's not interested and the rest of the kids are interested in other children? So these are all the normality versus abnormality you need to know. But these are the first red flags we call it in life. But who are the ones observing them? Parents. 
when you as a parent noticing all these things, then of course you discuss with your grandmother or your pediatrician. They say, hi, ah, he's he just basically just smart kid. He will, he will learn, just wait another six months. He will go and talk to the kids. Okay, I got the reassurance from my mother, my father. I'll do that another six months. Six months later, it still persists. So what are you going to do? So I think the question we need to ask ourselves is that we can make abnormal look like normal, and the normal can be look like abnormal. It's all in the perception. But rationality is basically what is going to decide your sense of how you're going to approach your kids' development. Because the reason is that it is a critically important stages of their life where they need to learn the things to progress. So that's important because if we don't progress through the stages, you are losing out on your child's progress. So there's somewhere he's getting stuck. By the way, if you have questions, feel free to stop and ask me the question. I'm happy to answer that. Okay, so then we learn about the behavior, pharmacology, receptors, pharmacogenomics. This is a science newly developed, which is basically like we do a swab test. There's several different swabs for these. One to test like what medications can work better. It's 30% more improvement than what it used to be now. Like, you know, for example, I'll go into that science later, but I think that's more for the advanced topic, not now. But the idea is that you can do a gene swap that can tell us about syndromes. Like if you have a kid has a chromosome abnormality, we can look at it. To, uh, and then we also have a pharmacogenomics, which is basically like a science of metabolism. So basically like you take a cheek swab and then based on that what meds work for you or not. Simple example I'll give you the only reason this is important is basically like this. For example, uh, there is a medicine called uh, Plavix, which is called the clopidogrel um, mono something. Uh, I don't know how they sold it in this country. But it's an anticoagulant medicine that is given after people are taking steps in their heart. So if you are a 2C19 poor metabolizer, if your dose is not adjusted, what basically happens is that you may have the excess of coagulability. If you are an ultra rapid metabolizer, you have eliminating the medicine faster than usual, leading them to have less of the coagulability. So basically, like you are increasing the risk of them really having a heart attack. So I think you know the. If you look at the new latest chemotherapies, basically like everybody gets sequenced for pharmacogenomics because the reason is they, they want to see what is the compatible drugs for that particular person to reduce the toxicity of those patients. Okay? Oh, let's go back. So, so I think the, uh, so our life story starts here. The only reason I put that one is that the fact is that, you know, from the, Time of our pregnancy, you know, we have a lot of thoughts about, okay, so due to the pregnancy, you see an OB, <coughs> OB divine typically does certain chromosomal tests like it's called alpha fetal protein, because the reason is the alpha fetal protein will tell you that how is your neurodevelopment is happening or not. And then to do an ultrasound, of course they don't tell you the sex in this country, but they're making sure that every organ is well developed. Because the reason is the sonograms help us to screen those up. So if you have a family history, for example, I, I didn't know that, but it's very common here, and that's what I understood is the G6PD deficiency, which is basically common here. But you know, you get screened here more often than they do in the US because the reason we don't do it. So there are specific communities in this country, like for example, in, in America, Ashkenazi Jews, they are very vulnerable because the reason there is a substantial amount of inbreeding happening. There's a lot of communities in this in this country because I come from one of those, right? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of inbreeding and that led to a lot of genetic abnormalities that are basically are part of that group of people subset. So if they're not get screened, you know, before birth or after, you are basically at risk of repeating in the next pregnancy after pregnancy. So it's very, very important that you need to do those screenings for those at those times. Okay? So, it's a, it also depends on like conception, right? If you have a natural conception, it's a different. If you have an IVF or you have used drugs to get pregnant, they are a, a different layer. Like, you know, some of them can have twin pregnancies, triple pregnancies, stuff like those can happen. So that comes with a lot of the medicine used in the pregnancy, delaying the labor because of the size of the babies and a lot of other things. 
Um, and then the delivery. It's also is important because the reason is the, um, in delivery of Wakanda, you know, a lot of people come to me and say, hey, my, I had a forceps delivery, it's an impact on my child. The bottom line is, the, you know, look, it, it's the, there is a subtle way of, uh, you know, risk is there, but it's not a fully aware risk at this point, at least what we know by, what we know as a science. Will they contribute to it? Possible. Will that be the only reason why your kid has problems? Maybe not. It could be one of the reasons, but it's not the whole reason why your kid has problems. <clears throat> so, why it is, you know, so for every stage there is something that's different. First year, the most important thing is, is he eating okay? Is he latching on to the, you know, the breast of the mother? Is he able to suck well? Is he able to have a colicness? Is he basically like having good bowel movements or like, you know, does he need a formula well or you have like a tolerance or certain formula? So when you're looking at all these things, they sound pretty stupid, but the bottom line is they're all giving you the signals. If a baby doesn't sleep well in the first year and he's an irritable baby, it basically is a concern for us because the reason is that whether that basically baby will ever sleep better later on or whether it continues to be that problematic. So why that is important? Sleep is an important. If you look at the standard baby, they need to sleep 20 hours a day. Okay, but if a kid is only sleeping eight hours a day, problematic. Okay, because the reason is these are the kind of things. And then 